In the early 1960s, more than 50 years ago, Max Duram and I ran a scientific expedition at sea. For that, we had a magnificent sailing boat, the Atuana, which was about 20 meters in length with 180 square meters of sail. On this old film, the boat looks primitive, yet truly majestic. Everything had to be done by the muscles of four or five experienced sailors. The sheets and halyards passed through large pulleys to help adjust the sails. The schooner passed through the Suez Canal into the Red Sea to carry out the coral survey. The trip to the Great South was magnificent, the boat gently moving with the variable waves. Life was wonderful. We were in a paradise surrounded by vast sun-drenched horizons. In the Mediterranean, there are always signs of history in the shape of gods, Greek and others, with biblical references in every corner. But here in the Red Sea, there is nothing, just the great silk road which disappears into the distance and loses itself in the endless unknown. The north wind frequently lifts the fine burnt sand from the desert and causes those ephemeral yellowish patterns and shades so delightful to watch. The boat was towing a maritime log, which is a propeller that, whilst turning, registers the distance covered, but sharks often attacked and damaged it, a monotonous desert coastline offered few useful landmarks. In those days, GPS did not exist, so the sextant was relied on and used at dawn's first light, when the horizon could be seen and the stars were still visible. The boat's position was then calculated. This is relatively easy to do, but an error of one second can put your position out by one kilometre. Finally, one day, we entered a large lagoon, and as soon as the coral bar is crossed, there are no more sea-sized waves. By the way, the small boat that delivers supplies to big ships is called a lighter because its draft was shallow enough to safely pass over these bars of coral that protected the inside part of the reefs while the larger ships anchored outside the reef. As we crossed the reef, one of us had to sit high up the mast to look out for any suspicious dark patches in the water and report the possible danger. From up there, the view is superb. The water is incredibly transparent and one can follow the shadow of your own boat passing over the well-lit seabed below. As soon as we drop anchor, the landscape is mind-boggling and makes our presence feel somewhat out of place. In this total silence, the sound of our voices or the creaking of a pulley seem to heighten the incongruity of it all. Now we re prepare for our first dive. Equipped with our heavy underwater camera, the best available at that time, we discover a different world of extraordinary beauty and wonder. In the delicate coral, there are huge numbers of paradise fish with their rounded shape and decorative tails. Angelfish, parrotfish, clownfish, and big Napoleon fish, with so many others, all with spectacularly bright colors. Our camera was fitted with stabilizer wings, which allowed us to take steady photographs in this wild, watery world. Before our lens passed all the activity of this unspoiled world, where the natural inhabitants lived out their lives, there were many sharks. Fortunately for us, this one is relatively harmless, but it is always best to avoid the hammerheads and tiger sharks. Murray eels live in the larger holes in the coral. Some of these eels can reach two or three meters in length and can be aggressive, so we keep our distance. The coral itself can be poisonous, and after 50 years, I still have the scars to prove it. As we were partly financed by the Swiss National Science Foundation, with further generous contributions from several major industries, we were able to invent and construct in our Swiss laboratories various devices and tools for measuring seismic activity 
and marine subsoil electrical resistors. After having tested them and used them in the Mediterranean for underwater archaeological research, we brought them through the Suez Canal to use them in the coral study in the Red Sea. It is important to know that coral can only live in symbiosis with certain species of phytoplankton, which are plants and, like all plants, they need sunlight to grow. However, sunlight only penetrates seawater to about 10 meters depth. Therefore, the existence of dead coral at great depths is difficult to explain. Again, coral can only live underwater, although often we saw it growing on the shore in sunny and dry places. We discussed this at length, and after taking samples for identification, we're able to offer various possible explanations, including using the measuring devices that we had installed on deck. Small portable computers did not exist, so all our calculations were done with slide rule. This is made easier by the use of logarithms, which transform multiplications into simple additions. During diving, seismic receptors were carefully installed on the seafloor near the coral. We recorded the echoes returned from the solid elements so that we were able to model the structure and foundations of the reefs. To map changes in electrical resistance of the marine subsoil, we pretended to be taking these measurements from under an insulated carpet. This almost completely removed the short circuit effect of salt water. We dragged our carpet through all the zone that we were studying. Once recorded on the topographic map, these measurements allowed us various modeling opportunities of the origins and formation of coral reefs. Meanwhile, life on board was idyllic, almost living in a holiday atmosphere. We had some cats on board to control any rodent problem. They happily shared the routine of this life on the waves. They were also delighted to have some of the fish that we caught every day augmenting their usual diet. Bashir, our Tunisian cook, had become the most colourful character on board. He was always telling us fascinating stories, such as a Moses in a Jalaba who crossed the Red Sea thanks to the miracles of Allah, or a Tunisian Herodotus who discovered the pyramids, but without knowing that they were tombs and the one about a pure and beautiful sultana whose private parts were quite similar to a gazelle's footprint in the desert sand. But now it's back to the Mediterranean. To return to our work in submarine archaeology, we take with us unforgettable memories of sailing and exploring in solitary and wild places.